Uh, hi, all. Very nice of uh, each of you to join. My name is Lee. Uh, you will be here listening to me for the next 40-ish minutes, 45 minutes or so. Um, if I catch some questions in the chat as we go, maybe we will hear from you as well. I'm hopeful that we will. Uh, I'm really excited about the conference today um, in part because I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas, where the conference was, was originally to be held. Uh, and I'm tickled that the organizers, um, Todd and the rest, and Nancy and the rest of the folks, Danny, have put on uh, this event virtually for us. So we're still able to share. Uh, I'm gonna share with you on some technology, but I'm also gonna share with you uh, really in, in the spirit of this conference. Um, and that will be um, about, um, well, about an open source project. And more than that project, about a collection of projects and a community around it. So, so let's get started. Let me uh, share with you. With any luck, we will also have a demo. And so, very good. So today it is the tech that we're gonna talk about is uh, service meshes and um, the challenge of adopting them. There are a number of service meshes out there. Um, not only do you have to make an intelligent decision when you try to adopt one, but also you need to overcome what might be your fears about, well, software-defined networking or, or next-gen software-defined networking. I think it depends on how you want to phrase that, but we're going to see if we can help get you past that today. Um, small bit about me, maybe the most important thing to take away from this slide is the URL that's in yellow. Um, not only, I think, will, will this recording be public later, um, so will the slides. As a matter of fact, all of the talks that I give go up on that yellow URL. And so uh, if you see something interesting that I maybe skipped over, you can find it there. I am, in general, a few things about me. I'm fairly busy in the cloud native ecosystem. And I think I used to characterize that as the container ecosystem. Um, and maybe still do. I, I spend some time as a Docker captain. Um, I spend some time as a CNCF ambassador um, and I chair one of the, well, the networking um, special interest group. I also have uh, written a few books on this particular topic on service meshes. I'm in the process, well, on the very front end of writing um, another one on service mesh patterns. So hopefully that will contain any number of good best practices. If I can get control of my slides again, we'll go to the next one and get off of me. Yeah, great. Now that I've skipped through all the slides. All right, uh, so I had said that uh, part of what we're gonna talk about is service mesh as a, as a technology, but also about um, layer five as an open source community. Uh, layer five is a community that's focused on, well, service meshes, but uh, through the auspices of, of that focus, also inherently focused on Kubernetes, Docker, and really distributed things. Um, so th this is a call to come on over. The community is warm, it's welcoming. There's a Slack channel that's probably where you will find the most activity going on. There are uh, three open source projects being stewarded in the community. And we will talk about a little bit about each of them today. Um, that community, just to, to give you a, a sense, uh, since we're here at, at Open Source 101, um, to give you a sense of it having gone from, from zero to what it is currently, it's been right at a year now uh, that a, a couple of us had gotten together that were interested in service meshes and interested in solving really the thing that we're talking about today, the, the adopters dilemma. It was as we were giving workshops on this technology that we kept getting asked the same questions about how to stand up a service mesh, which one to use, what's the overhead of a mesh, um, how, do they, um, how do they perform, how should I configure them, how do I run them well, what should I expect out of them. We formed this, uh, well, this open source community layer five and um, it's grown and the projects that it stewards has grown. As a matter of fact, it's grown so much that we'll be um, shortly donating meshery to the CNCF. 
Meshery is a pro one of the, the, the biggest project that we'll be talking about uh, later. So uh, this slide maybe both encourages you the, to come and join. It's an active community, much happening. We have um, 10, uh, I don't know, we have uh, many new joiners each day. We, we, in fact, because of that, and boy, I don't seem to be able to control my slides much today. Um, bear with me. Because of that, we've instituted a new program there um, called MeshMates. Um, it's a, it's a, a mentor program to help uh, first time open source contributors um, get familiar with what it's like to jump into the, to a community like this. And when I say open source contributors, I don't necessarily mean code, uh, but a lot of other things. So come and join the community. You'll, you'll see what I'm saying. Of the of a service meshes, I think you know for those that are going to adopt them, you might still have a little bit of this question in your mind about what a service mesh is, and you know there's a, there's a formal definition. If you, if you bore yourself enough to read one of the, the books that I've authored, it, it says that it's you know it, it sort of regurgitates what it is that each of the meshes themselves kind of describe themselves as, and that is a dedicated layer for managing service to service communication. And that, doesn't really explain it. And so some people refer to them as a microservices platform. I think that that's partially true. There are some service meshes that are large enough and um, have enough capabilities, have enough extensibility that you can build on top of them, that they do become, that layer does become something of a platform. Um, myself and some others have, and I really don't know what's going on with my slides. Let me come out of full screen there and just see if this serves us better. Um, myself and some others have characterized them as a services first network. So essentially um, a, a service mesh lays down um, a, a new layer, a new networking layer that's really for purposes of taking care of the needs of your distributed applications, the needs of your microservices. Now, you don't have to be using microservices to benefit from a service mesh, but I would say the more services you're running, um, the more that you benefit from a mesh. You can onboard, and we'll talk about it, um, existing applications that you have that are running on bare metal or in VMs, you can onboard those onto the mesh as well. Um, what we'll be talking about mostly today is, uh, is sort of in context of well, in context of running an application on Kubernetes, which um, this is an example of. Uh, and this is, well, this is Istio's um, sample application. Each of the service meshes that we'll talk about come generally come with a sample app so that you can um, gain some familiarity with uh, what a service mesh does. Each one of those sample apps sort of does a good job of highlighting the value of a mesh. And this example one um, is no, uh, no exception. It is written in, it's, it's really a simple book catalog. And we'll actually look at two of these today. We'll look at Istio's book catalog and, uh, as a sample app, and we'll look at Linkerd's book catalog as a sample app as well. Um, what's pictured here is, is Istio's. Conceptually, they're, they're probably you know, relatively fairly similar. Um, this one is broken into four individual services. Each of these services is written in a different language which begins to highlight uh, part of the value of a mesh, it, it working across languages, providing the value that we're gonna talk about irrespective of what language you're running. Now, this is what that app looks like when it's not deployed on a mesh, but is running in a Kubernetes environment. This is what that app looks like, well, specifically when it's deployed on certain types of meshes. Um, some service meshes, uh, and we're going to look at the architecture of different service meshes, but some of them will um, inject a network proxy um, and sidecar it next to your application containers inside the same Kubernetes pod. When they do that, they essentially form a new services first network the network that we were just describing. And really the traffic, the requests that go to your services, go in between your services and go in and out of your services are facilitated now 
by the service proxy that's sidecar next to your app. So we'll, we'll look at this um, more in detail and give, uh, do a, a demo of how that works. But first, you know, I would say as, as people go to adopt service meshes, they do it for any number of reasons. Um, it really depends on your use cases as to which particular piece of value you, you assign the most well, that, that you ascribe to the most, that you're looking to, to um, run a mesh for. One of those is observability. Um, the traffic that then now flows across a service mesh, that the requests and the traffic that a service mesh is watching and facilitating, well, it can generate all kinds of telemetry, all kinds of uh, signals about that. And by all kinds, I generally mean um, traces, logs, and met metrics. Uh, and you can then um, ingest those that telemetry into your you know, monitoring system of choice uh, and get a lot of value, kind of take the blinders off, if you will, without uh, having, having had to instrument your app. Now, there's a couple of asterisks about the observability that, I'm, that I was just talking about. Um, I guess I'll go back for a moment and say much of this is the, the metrics and the logs are generally kind of uh, black box to your application container, meaning that uh, the metrics and the logs that are generated from a mesh are generally focused on the traffic that's flowing um, into and between your services. The traces, the distributed tracing that you'll get out of a mesh um, is more of what you would describe as white box monitoring. So, so you do see latency um, of the transactions that your services are processing in a very granular way. Uh, and so, yeah, good. So I'm glad I made that disclaimer. Um, the other capabilities that people deploy a service mesh for are well, fine grained traffic control. Um, when you lay down uh, that, all of those proxies and you're able to control their configuration and direct traffic, there's a lot of things that you can do when a proxy, a network proxy, is able to open up that packet and introspect it, drop it, reroute it, um, uh, take in a conditional. Maybe a particular person is logged in, and so that they should their traffic should be routed somewhere else. Um, maybe their traffic should be queued before others. Um, because of that control, you're also able to do a lot of well, essentially um, chaos engineering. You're able to um, both, at, well, both chaos engineering and resiliency. I think to the extent that you can inject chaos, you can also configure a mesh to uh, be provide a bunch of resiliency to your services. So you can um, add in uh, retries for failed requests that might go through. Um, you can add in rate limiting uh, on your APIs or on your endpoints so that they don't get overwhelmed. You can have um, those connections to your services um, break or, or it basically invoke a circuit breaker. Um, there's a lot of things. Another, another aspect of a, a service mesh that, that people look for is security. Um, central to the concept of a service mesh is identity and the notion that every service that's deployed on a mesh gets a unique ID, gets a unique identity. And it's because of that identity that um, service meshes are able to facilitate um, east, west, if you will, uh, secure connections, those done through mutual TLS. And so between observability, um, granular network control, and, um, and this enhanced security, there's a lot that people expect out of a mesh. And this is in part why people use service meshes. It's, it's also to avoid things like um, writing all of those concerns that we just talked about into your application code. If your infrastructure is capable of taking care of those things, um, which a service mesh can, then that really obviates the need to incorporate that infrastructure, those infrastructure concerns into your application code. That, that some of those concerns can kind of melt off your business logic, if you will, and um, let and you can you know, expect more out of your infrastructure. You can avoid doing duplicative work. Um, like if you're having to build in the, the, like the rate limiting that I was just mentioning, 
or having to redirect traffic based on the presence of a cookie or the fact that someone is logged in, um, if you're having to build that into your application code, you can um, hand that off to the, the mesh to do those things. You can make sure that the behavior of your network, the behavior of the way that your services respond um, is uniform. The, the observability, the, the telemetry that you get out of your services, the way in which you manage manage them and, and what you're, what signals you're looking at, you can ha you can immediately get a uniform um, visibility across services running on a mesh because the it doesn't matter what language you're running, the service mesh will provide the same telemetry out of um, out of your deployment. It also you know fairly notably um, eliminates a, a diffusion of responsibility about whose responsibility it is to, in fact, define the, those, a rate limit, to define the retry count. Um, is that the developer? Is that the operator? Is um, Who's defining your service level objective? Um, maybe it's an SRE, maybe it's a service owner. Uh, right now that can be diffused and it's not always clear whose responsibility that is. Or if it is uh, maybe an operator's responsibility, maybe they don't have uh, today, they don't have control to affect that change. They have to go to the, the development team to have that change made. Well, when a service mesh comes forth, um, that is really empowering of the operator. It's also really empowering of the developer who can begin to not focus on some of those concerns. Service meshes also help, like I said before, about the well, with modernizing your existing applications. So the, some meshes, not all of them, um, will uplift your existing apps. See, they don't necessarily need to be running in containers to run on a mesh. So people will run service meshes because of the things that I just mentioned, and uh, also because they're looking to move faster. They're looking to um, increase the, the speed by which they, they release software, by, by which they release new features. And it's kind of interesting to take a look back over how it is that we develop software, and how that um, the practices by which we do that have evolved over time, the way in which we architect our applications, the way in which we package and deploy them, the infrastructure that we run them on. Um, an interesting note here is that I consider that there's a lot of similarities between the value proposition of functions, of FAS compute, and that of service meshes. And that is to say that a service mesh can span um, you know, um, these different cloud layers, if you will, um, including functions. Um, functions provide, you know, also have a similar value proposition around letting people, letting developers in specific focus on uh, just business logic and only having to run, you know, uh, run that particular piece of business logic. But that doesn't fit all types of services are all, well, not even services, but all types of applications, all types of workloads that you're gonna to wanna to run. They work well for short-lived event-driven things. Much of the workloads that we have in the world today are longer-lived. They're, they're um, long-lived long services that, that are always hot and are, tend to be process-driven. Service Mesh can provide value in the face of that. So um, as we, uh, as we, go to get into some more specifics here about the architectures of the meshes. Um, I'll first say that it's fairly clear that um, service mesh adoption is coming in a big way. I mean, it really you know, could be characterized as kind of a third major step that a lot of us take in our cloud native journey. Um, if you look at the timeframe by which some of these, these, these steps were announced, or the time frame by which the, the 1.0 or the GA version of each of the most popular um, projects or pro products in these areas. Um, we are, I think, you know, service mesh as, a, as a, a buzzword, if you will, was pretty buzzy uh, and, uh, over the last couple of years. I think what, what we're going to be seeing now that it's been around for some time and people are, more and more people are, uh, running more and more containers, um, service mesh deployments are probably going to get uh, pretty real. And we'll actually talk about a couple. Um, I talked about the, the notion that 
that responsibility becomes a bit, dif- um, or the diffusion of responsibility begins to go away when a, a mesh is present, that both developers and operators are empowered with this smarter uh, infrastructure. That's actually maybe the the key to um, the, sort of the, the the hidden secret, if you will, as to what the real value of a service mesh is. Um, this uh, fifth layer, this, um, and if you're familiar with uh, the OSI model, kind of the layer five is a uh, the session layer, um, and it's a bit tongue in cheek, but um, conceptually, uh, the service mesh is sort of laid down at, at that in that space. They, they clearly speak layer seven and interact with your applications and your services. But it's pretty interesting that um, both of these teams are empowered and they're empowered to maybe decouple a little bit and iterate and move forward independent of one another. So there are um, some a number of case studies of different organizations having deployed. Uh, and the, the two examples I'm using here are Istio and Linkerd. Um, but having deployed a service mesh and having uh, significantly benefited uh, in terms of the the overall cost of of running their infrastructure or the the cost that it would have taken to get to um, a highly secured um, kind of uh, east-west traffic like we were talking about before, for them to be able to get to something like that would have taken, in in this case, in the example on the left, about six months to secure that infrastructure um, took a lot less uh, when when a mesh was deployed. So kind of interesting. Let's talk about the um, service mesh architectures and uh, some of their differences. So we, we took a look at a sample app earlier and we, and we talked about how for some meshes, running your workload on the service mesh means that, that you would have a service proxy sidecar to your application. Some meshes um, have that architecture and and some don't. Um, There are pros and cons to both of those, but irrespective of that, uh, those different models, um, this this sort of high level architecture holds true for each each service mesh that you might encounter. So the the first layer here, the first kind of um, architectural component is referred to as the the data plane inside of a service mesh. This is really where all of the network proxies, all those service proxies um, are logically grouped. They are, they're kind of the the workhorse of the service mesh. So those, those myriad proxies are the ones that are doing the heavy lifting. They're intercepting, uh, well, um, transparently intercepting uh, network requests and doing things with those requests. So they're, they're responsible for quite a bit. Um, the, the next layer here, the next um, plane, network plane, is the control plane. This is a, often where you as an individual um, operator or someone who's deploying a service mesh might interface with that service mesh and apply configuration. The, the control plane deals with speaking to the proxies updating their configuration. And it's, it's really the, the point of control um, uh, for a given type of service mesh. If you are of a networking background or, or not, you, you, you may have come across the concept of a management plane, which is to say that uh, the world isn't just service meshes. And um, there are you know, any number of control planes. I think for some of you who are running Kubernetes or are familiar with Kubernetes, it too has a control plane. So there are, there are many control planes for a variety of systems that, that people are running. Um, a management plane layers on top to help stitch these together, to help federate um, service mesh deployments, whether those are the same type of service mesh or different types of service, service meshes. They come in to layer on um, enhanced uh, policy and governance. Uh, maybe do perform some chaos engineering, maybe to uh, help with some cost control, um, to do a lot of things that you wouldn't expect a control plane itself to do. So if we take a look uh, at some specific examples of how these architectures uh, come to life, um, if we take a look at, at Istio, 
Um, Istio has undergone some architectural change recently. <clears throat> um, the logical components that we're showing here are um, are uh, perform certain uh, duties and in the control plane uh, for for Istio. When you deploy it on in a Kubernetes environment, that control plane will be deployed and, and its components will be deployed inside of a, a separate namespace. That namespace is reserved for um, Istio's uh, well Istio's control plane components: Galley, Pilot, Citadel, Mixer. Um, just briefly. Uh, to, to highlight what each of these components do, Dali and Pilot deal with interfacing with the underlying um, platform and the underlying infrastructure, uh, interfacing with Kubernetes maybe, um, sourcing where it is that Kubernetes is scheduling and placing various services. So it's interfacing with service discovery. It's then um, taking that configuration and reformatting it to push down that configuration to the individual sidecar proxies. Citadel as a component in Istio is dealing with um, certificates and uh, identity. And Mixer is dealing with uh, enforcing policy and collecting telemetry. And so if we take a look at um, another uh, service mesh, th this one is, uh, well, can run with or with an existing Istio deployment or, or it will kind of deploy a new Istio deployment for you. Um, Octarine is a security centric uh, service mesh and helping you run your services more securely. It too has a control plane and a data plane. Um, Linkerd, you're probably you know, also familiar with a control plane and a data plane, um, different control plane components. Um, we're seeing more and more that it's common for the control planes to include a small instance of Grafana or Prometheus, um, if for nothing else to help people get up and running and, and um, get at that observability, get at those telemetric um, signals. Um, Linkerd in this case also comes with a user interface. But, it, and those were kind of the three architectures, the three sample architectures. The reality is like it, that it's uh, meshy out there, if you will. It's, there are, you know, you know, about 20 something different service meshes. Some of them share, have much commonality while others really don't. And so there's a, one of the projects that that open source community, Layer 5, um, curates is a landscape of, well, service meshes and related technologies. And so you'll see some, a, a lot of information about the service meshes here at Layer 5 IO slash landscape. You'll also um, very shortly see a bunch of opinions answering the service mesh adopters dilemma. Uh, one of them, which is, which mesh should I adopt? It will um, fairly shortly provide a lot of opinion about that and try to help you, um, try to help direct you um, based on your environment because the answer there isn't so simple. It's really like, it depends. It depends on, well, a lot of things. We're, we'll talk about some of them. Um, it, so it is a multi-mesh world today. We'll see if um, how much that does or does not consolidate you know, going forth. Uh, because it is a multi-mesh world today, there are service mesh abstractions that have come about. Um, one of those is called um, Service Mesh Interface, or SMI. It's intended to be something of a, a lowest common denominator um, interface, a standard interface uh, behind which service meshes might plug in. And so you as an adopter, instead of interfacing with the specific APIs of uh, any given mesh, you uh, would instead interface with this um, standard API, SMI. Another one that's, that's out there is one for helping federate the catalogs of different, either the same type of mesh or different meshes, um, such that in a multi-cluster environment or a multi-mesh environment, that uh, the services that one is providing for and running can be um, spoken to and exchanged uh, between meshes so they can be cognizant to one another. There's a third um, specification coming forth here, uh, and it's the service mesh performance specification. It's uh, SMPS. It's one for um, capturing and describing the performance of a service mesh. Um, it's um, not an easy thing to necessarily do. It captures the performance of a mesh, and, and it also offers up that 
performance numbers in context of the value that you're getting out of the mesh. So it gives you the tools to um, help understand if you're running, doing a good job of running your infrastructure, if you're really getting the value that you should be out of a mesh, and it lets you do it in a comparative way, which is really like the two, you know, the, the two very prominent questions that people ask when they go to adopt a service mesh, which is what um, I mentioned earlier on. And so um, earlier on, I'd said that we might get to a demo, and I think that we, we will. I think we've got time. I'm just, just checking. So because of those two questions, um, I, was saying, I was saying before that we, we, um, a, a collection of open source-centric individuals, including myself, went off to build this project, uh, Meshery. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, service mesh management plane. It manages multiple meshes, um, irrespective of whether it's managing multiple meshes or just one, it really provides the same value. So it tries to address the two questions we were just looking at, which one to adopt, how to get your service mesh up, what are the best practices of running that service mesh, and what's the, what should I expect in terms of overhead? How should I ongoing manage that overhead? Uh, because that the performance of your workload and the performance of your service mesh will change over time. Meshery is, uh, well, soon to be the, well, it's, it's, um, it's an implementation of, has an implementation of SMI. It, uh, in, in terms of like this conference in particular, um, open source 101 at home, um, this community and this open source project participates and has interns through the Linux Foundation's Community Bridge, which I'm not sure um, how many of you have necessarily heard of that, uh, but it's but it's an up and coming program and has been there um, about a year and a half now. Uh, and it also has interns through Google Summer of Code. And so the, the community, the, the layer five community that it's within is um, very much so uh, friendly to open source newcomers and helps people cut their teeth on what it means to participate in an open source project. So Meshery um, is a management plane. So we were talking about the data plane, the control plane, and um, we gave examples of what service meshes look like, and what their control planes look like, what their data planes look like. And here's an example of what a, a management plane looks like. And so, so Meshery interfaces with any number of, well, and I guess by any number, I mean today, six different types of service meshes. We've been fortunate that we've, for the most part, had maintainers from um, Citrix and uh, Octarine and NSM, or network service mesh, rather, from, from a number of places come and create adapters between Meshery and those specific service meshes. Um, so management plan, again, kind of layers in on top. Um, Meshery does support those six service meshes today. It's our hope and kind of the, uh, an agreement that with each of these service mesh projects, each of those either products or projects that, that create the service meshes listed here, they will eventually incorporate Meshery um, into their build and release system to be able to, um, well, assess the performance of those service meshes as they're being released and to be able to baseline and benchmark the service mesh performance from release to release. It's one thing for the vendors or the, the projects themselves to do that, which is great. And it's yet another for you as an individual, as an adopter to take Meshery as a tool and run it in your environment against your clusters, against your workloads, right? Because the environments are very different. Your needs are different as well. Um, part of the lineup, part of how Meshery as a tool helps people adopt is to, well, analyze the configuration of your service mesh and to tell you when you're doing it wrong or, or maybe not so much that as to suggest when, how you might do it better. I mean, so there are you know, built into Meshery are a number of different um, best practices, uh, which is um, in part kind of the, the focus of that, the, the book that I was mentioning earlier. So it helps people operate with confidence. The other thing that uh, 
well, that Meshery does is the that third specification that I was talking about earlier, the, the service mesh abstractions that we were talking about. The service mesh performance specification, SMPS, is under active development now. We've been fortunate to partner with uh, a couple of universities and have got some research going on about how to how to really um, you know inform people that you're 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 squeezing as much value out of your mesh as possible. How to make sure that you're you're optimizing that you're getting maybe for example as much distributed tracing as you would like out of your mesh, but doing so um, in the in the in the least expensive way with the lowest overhead. Part of that is to be able to compare to, well, across service meshes, maybe as part of your decision to adopt them. But another part of that is also just comparing to your neighbor, your proverbial neighbor, if you will. So if you've chosen a given mesh um, and you've configured it and you're running it and you're deriving some value, but you're paying, paying for that, you know, in terms of memory and CPU and, and latency overhead, are you doing it well or not? And so part of um, the project that we have here is to, uh, it, well, is to engage with those universities and engage with adopters like you to um, do some statistical analysis a bunch of, uh, across a bunch of different environments. Right now, there's a little, we're a little shy of about a thousand um, performance tests having been run in a variety of environments. And we're gonna take those, those results and analyze them and share. Um, of what I'm showing here on the screen is, well, a fairly old actually example of kind of the difference in overhead between kind of each of these three service meshes and running what's essentially the same workload, but um, how much in this case, I think it is in terms of memory, how much memory that the control plane for each of these took up. Now, the, what, I wouldn't want for you to do is to walk away from this thinking um, that Istio it has so much more overhead than the others, because that would be entirely inaccurate. Um, that, or that would be not understanding that in this case, Istio was doing about three times as much as the others, depending upon how you quantify that. And that's really the, the purpose of that service mesh performance specification is to help quantify that in the most vendor neutral of ways. So, so good. So let's see if we can uh, stop my yammering and see if we can do a demo, um, demo of a management plane, a demo of meshery. I think that is, yeah. That was... All right, so, so. Uh, we took, I think, a brief look at, at Meshery's architecture earlier. Let me let me stop sharing there and start sharing. Well, my whole screen, so that you can see me, seeing me, looking at myself, seeing me. I guess, or hopefully not very long. Is that that long? Okay. Good. Good. Um, you should all be seeing, well, I guess, my ugly mug on this side and then um, a terminal over here on the left. <clears throat> um, if I get this right, we have, we either have five minutes left or 10 minutes left. And I think Nancy's probably saying five minutes. So, so let's see what we can knock out in five minutes. Uh, so Meshery as a utility comes with uh, a CLI. And actually, let me go back a slide. You can um, quickly get Meshery either, like there's a bunch of vari a variety of ways to install it. One way is to use Homebrew and just um, install the tap and do a brew install Meshery CTL and you do a Meshery start. Or another way is to use this bash script. Um, either way, you'll find that you can run um, one script and have Meshery downloaded, have Meshery start as a set of uh, containers. In this case, I'm running Meshery locally on my iMac that I'm speaking to you from. Um, and, and Meshery starts up as a Docker Compose file or um, app. So you can go over and maybe check the status of it. So it's a collect. It's a few different containers. One is just you, that of Meshery server, a small um, static Go binary that that is Meshery. It contains the server and the UI that we're about to look at. And then it, there, there's one um, small 
adapter available as well for each diff each of the six six different types of service meshes that Meshery um, uh, supports. So we'll go ahead and log into Meshery. Uh, when we do, we'll make this screen a little bigger. We end up what we'll find is that Meshery will uh, attempt to automatically detect um, where your Kubernetes cluster is. And in my case, my Kubernetes cluster is local. I'm running um, Docker desktop. And so I've just got um, Kubernetes running um, via Docker desktop. So it grabs my local cube config. Um, uh, I can do a quick connection test just to verify that Meshery can talk to Kubernetes. Great. Um, Meshery also has each of these adapters loaded up so that we can go um, interface with, it will provision and interface and configure and analyze and do performance tests across any of these service meshes. Meshery also understands, you know, kind of what I was saying earlier about Grafana and Prometheus as prominent observability tools um, being either available, uh, in, you know, commonly in your environments or uh, coming as part and parcel to the control plane of a given mesh. And so let's uh, see what I've got running in my environment. So it looks like I've got Istio deployed at the moment, which is good since we're running low on time. We're going to do a quick, maybe we've got Istio deployed and we've got Istio sample app, that book info app I was talking about earlier. Um, we'll do a quick demo of uh, Istio and its sample app and then hit Linkerd's uh, real quick as well. So, so um Within Meshery, you're able to go over and um, you know, interact with a given mesh. So in this case, where we're choosing to interact with Istio, uh, I think before I forget one thing, you know, a lot of times we'll say, hey, you want to go over and provision Istio. There's different configurations that it supports. You might want to go provision a, a given sample app to get familiar with Istio. And, and once you have, we've provisioned book info in this environment. You might want to begin to manipulate traffic and configure the service mesh to, to, do, to do different things based on the presence of that sample app. Another thing that East, uh, Meshery will do is check the, um, the configuration of your mess, your, your, me your mess, your mesh against best practices to see if you have a mess. Uh, in this case, I don't, the, these checks are running, I'm um, just fine, but there's, there's about nine or 10 of them that it's running right now. Um, to let me see, I should have uh, that sample application, the Istio's book info sample app sitting here running and I'm just kind of refreshing my screen and we're seeing some different responses. If we go um, answer one of the service mesh adopters questions around performance and, and, under, and trying to help them understand what um, overhead there is, um, We can go over and run um, a test. Um, maybe give this a name. You can say what service mesh we'd like to test this against. In this case, um, Istio. I'm going to um, give my Max, my IMAX, um, uh, host IP address, my, my Wi Fi IP address. Um, which is how Meshery that's running as a container inside of Docker, Docker um, can interface with product page that's running in Kubernetes, running on top of Istio and Kubernetes. We can sit here and run um, a quick test. You know, that test, uh, we can essentially tell Meshery to generate a bunch of HTTP load against uh, that endpoint product page and give it some parameters in terms of just how, how hard we want to hit that. Um, inter, you know, the, that endpoint and for how long. Um, when that's done, what we'll get back is an analysis of that traffic. We'll, we'll be able to understand the, the throughput, uh, how, many, how much load we were able to get through in this time frame, and something of an analysis of the, the latency. Um, and actually, this is kind of funny because what we've got, is we've generated um, a statistical analysis of the P50, the P75, P99, um, we're actually seeing that the P99.9 as being way out here, um, which is a little bit different from a lot of tests that, that I'll, a lot of results that I'll typically get back. But, but basically, Meshery will count up all of those HTTP packets that it sent, 
um, categorize them into a histogram, um, uh, calculate them. It'll capture the environment that I'm in because that, that certainly plays a large role in terms of how quickly things can respond, how much memory I assigned to my VM. I'm fortunate that I'm on a machine that has a lot of, that, anyway, uh, how much memory I've assigned to my VM, how many cores I have. Um, if I was also, if I had also connected to Grafana, I would be seeing down below um, charts, uh, metrics, showing me also the, the CPU and memory overhead of my nodes in my Kubernetes cluster. Um, after I run a few of those, um, and I ran one a few minutes ago, um, you can come here and, and you know, kind of re look at that, that, those results. You can, um, if you run a few, you can go over and compare those results. Um, this, because if you've made changes in your environment, you might want to um, um, see how, see how, if you're willing to, you know, what the overhead is for a given network function that you're having the service mesh perform, which can be very helpful. And so you can benchmark and then you can baseline over time. Um, we're about at time. So I, I said that I would um, try to show you a couple of meshes. So let me uh, do this very briefly. I'm just gonna set a watch on, um, on our pods that are running in my, my local cluster. I'm having Meshery delete um, or deprovision the sample app for book info, and, as well as just deprovision Istio itself. So we should see Istio and its namespace going away as well as that sample app. While that's going on, I'm gonna go over to um, Linkerd and I'm gonna go ahead and deploy Linkerd to the default namespace. Um, and, and deploy the latest version of Linkerd. Um, as that starts to come up, uh, we might want to give that a moment to come up so that we can, once Linkerd is there, deploy Linkerd's kind of book catalog, book catalog, if you will, and go take a look at it. Um, as this comes up, I don't, I know we're right at time, so I'm, I'm a bit leery that this, this next bit is probably not horrifically impressive, just as soon as this is there. But rather what we're gonna do is just provision um, uh, the Linkerd's book catalog and then go over and um, get access to it, uh, which would be to do a port forward, I think, of, uh, of its web, Web app, port 7,000. Um, very briefly. Uh, here we go. Of which I think I'm already port forwarding. Uh, let's see if it's, if it's there. Or I'm not, yeah, I am. But that container that I was forwarding to before isn't there. And so that's what happens when you um, do your, uh, when, when you pre-provision um, before you give your, your talk. So anyway, since we're at time, I won't go fix it just, just um, because. But what I will leave you with is an invite to join the Layer 5 community, this open source community. Many, many people um, cutting their teeth for the first time on, well, a lot of things, on open source, on service meshes. Um, heck, a lot of folks that join don't know Kubernetes or really Docker either, but that doesn't stop them from, well, actually from three of them recently getting hired at Red Hat based on the work that they've done in the community. So, um, so, so no guarantees that people will get um, job offers, but, but uh, we'll hope to see you in there, so. Thanks all. I'll look for comments and questions in the chat. Very nice to have you today.